Today's episode is brought to you by Wondrium. The concept of love is something none of us are strangers to, even if it is unrequited love. From our teenage years, or maybe even before that, it's pretty natural for us to develop crushes, or end up having feelings for someone. Love, in that sense, is almost unavoidable, and whilst one may fight to resist it, no matter how jaded a person gets, they always come back for more. So it's interesting that despite us being so enveloped in this concept or feeling of love throughout our lives, we still don't really know what it is, still don't really understand it, and usually make a pig's dinner of it, right when we think we've got it figured out. Love, as I'm sure we all know, has the ability to rejuvenate us and elevate us, boosting us to a level of excitement not thought possible. On the other hand, it can also crush us under its cruel heel, and bring us to our knees until we surrender beneath it. I'm reminded of Merlin in Disney's Sword in the Stone, where he tells Arthur that love isn't just stronger than gravity, it's probably the strongest force in the world. It should come as no real surprise then, that with such a power, it can lead us to great emotional heights, or terrible downfalls. But our inability to master this love stuff isn't entirely our fault. After all, with every passing generation, the rules of the game, if you will, change, and only appear to get more and more complicated. You only have to look back into the 90s for example, to see the stark difference of our values, our attitude, and how we approach love with a little less complexity and a little more simplicity. Again, this isn't entirely our fault, given that social constructs are always changing, and whilst love is still in the proverbial air, I would say there are more pitfalls and conditions in today's society than there's ever been before. Despite the age of the internet opening up our lines of communication and theoretically doubling our chances of finding love, in some ways it's actually set us back. From the frequent trends of social media's influence, unrealistic body standards, and human shopping, uh, I, I mean dating apps like Tinder, Bumble, and where souls go to die, Hinge, Dating and the ability to find love has never been more complex. So how did the old civilizations fare in this most hodgepodgeical, most illogical, most confusing, most befuddling thing called love? Well to answer that, it might be useful to look at the Mesopotamian attitude, and what better way to do that, given that we don't really have any other way, than to look at their writings. But before we get started on today's episode, a brief message from the sponsor of today's video, Wondrium. Wondrium is a subscription on-demand video learning service that features lectures and courses from some of the top professors around the world, some even from the Ivy League and other prestigious universities. It's a museum for your mind, an institution for your imagination, and a gallery for your personal genius. With over 6,000 hours of video courses, documentaries, and series, there's plenty to get stuck into, from science, maths, history, literature, or even the more creative arts, like photography. A course that I've used this year is Travelling the Roman Empire, with archaeologist Darius Aria. Viewers can enjoy seeing the expanse of the Roman Empire over the continents, and get to meet several of its larger-than-life emperors. Those interested in just how Rome organised its provinces and its resources may also be particularly interested in this course, as Darius Aria quite literally deep dives into the Roman ruins to see what secrets can be unearthed. One thing that stood out to me in this course was the intriguing scenes of each location, from buried ruins, underground caverns, and historic monuments, the secrets of Rome are laid bare. There's such a huge selection to choose from Wondrium, and so I'm sure you won't have any difficulty finding something that tickles your fancy. You can access Wondrium via your PC, tablet, or even your phone, and you can learn university-grade content at your own pace. Right now, Wondrium are offering a free trial, so if you love learning as much as I do, be sure to head on over to wondrium.com slash thelegendsofhistory to gain access to a lecture library of over 11,000 videos, or hit the link in the description below. And now back to today's Sunday special. It was back in the 1800s when the love song for Shu Sin was discovered, a poem thought to be written in the year 2000 before the Common Era. If its name didn't give it away, 
then you ought to know that the love song for Shu Sin was indeed a love poem, now considered to be the oldest love poem ever written. It was during this time that archaeologists descended on the regions of Mesopotamia in the hopes of finding documentation, or even some kind of physical evidence, that corroborated the stories found in the Old Testament. Instead, they ended up finding ancient cuneiform tablets. For those of you who don't know, cuneiform is the oldest script we know of today, and was used by the Mesopotamians by pressing a reed pen or a stylus into a clay tablet. When the clay dried, it made for a decent writing surface, and once fired up, whatever was written on the surface became permanent and almost perfectly preserved. Of the many tablets found in these regions, none being so many as the ones found at the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal's library, the attempt to corroborate the stories of the Old Testament kind of backfired, because it showed that many of these stories had already been recorded by the Mesopotamians, albeit with different characters and different gods. Because of these revelations, those that would have a major impact on both scholarship and faith for the world at the time, tablets such as the love song for Su Xin were pushed to the side, in favour of those that shed a new light on stories such as the fall of man and Noah's Ark, most notably in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The love song for Su Xin meanwhile was transported to Istanbul, virtually unexamined and uncared for. In fact it was so grossly overlooked that it wasn't looked at again until 1951, when Sumerologist Samuel Noah Kramer, who was trying to decide on what to translate next, stumbled across it in a museum drawer. Having scanned the first few lines of the poem, it became increasingly obvious to him that what he held was not some store records of a civilian, or some thousand year old gibberish, but instead a love song, the oldest love song ever written by the hand of man. Of course, going by the nature and the content of the poem, it becomes indicative that this was not penned by a male, but instead a poem written by a woman. In order to understand the poem and extract what it tells us about love from an age long lost to us, it may be beneficial to learn who the lucky man in question was, this Shu Sin. Shu Sin was believed to have been a Mesopotamian king in the city of Ur, reigning from the years 1972 to 1964 before the Common Era. Other chronologies do place Shu Sin as reigning between the years 2037 to 2029 before the Common Era, but neither one can really be confirmed. Of course, his reign would determine when the poem which was dedicated to him was penned, but as this cannot be identified, scholars agree that the authorship of the poem took place somewhere in the year 2000 before the Common Era. Reigning over the territories of Sumer and Akkad, Shu Sin took his name after the moon god Sin, before going on to crush revolts from the Amorite communities. However, his most notable contribution to history is probably his inadvertent serving as muse for the poet who would write about him. But is the age of the poem all that separates it from the waterfall of poetry that followed it? Or was there something more profound in its words? Something no other poem could do? Something that showed us what love truly is? Uh, actually, no, it's, it's actually pretty erotic. Here, I'll read it for you. Bridegroom, dear to my heart, goodly is your beauty, honey sweet. Lion, dear to my heart. Goodly is your beauty, honey sweet. You have captivated me. Let me stand trembling before you. Bridegroom, I would be taken by you to the bedchamber. You have captivated me. Let me stand tremblingly before you. Lion, I would be taken by you to the bedchamber. Bridegroom, let me caress you. My precious caress is more savoury than honey. In the bedchamber, honey filled. Let me enjoy your goodly beauty. Lion, let me caress you. My precious caress is more savoury than honey. Bridegroom, you have taken your pleasure of me. Tell my mother, she will give you delicacies. My father, he will give you gifts. Your spirit, I know where to cheer your spirit. Bridegroom, sleep in our house until dawn. Your heart, I know where to gladden your heart. Lion, sleep in our house until dawn. You, because you love me. Give me prey of your caresses, my Lord God, my Lord Protector, my Shu Sin, 
who gladdens Enlil's heart. Give me prey of your caresses, your place goodly as honey. Pray lay your hand on it. Bring your hand over like a honeypot lid. Cup your hand over it like a honeypot lid. So for those of you expecting some ancient insights and powerful wisdom from a people who lived many millennia before us, well, too bad. It turns out the Mesopotamians were just as sexed up as we are now. Indeed, whilst that may be true to some extent when we consider human nature, the poem adopts a more significant role in history, when it is read less like a poem and more as a religious rite. Allow me to explain. You see, the poem is certainly the voice of a woman about to be married, or possibly just married on her wedding day, and an appreciation of her husband, in this case the king Shu Sin, she wishes to praise her lover and shower him with the utmost adoration. She's unwilling and possibly discouraged from holding anything back, and so she's not only expressing her romantic love, but also expressing her sexual desires, as well as praising the king for his erotic prowess. Now you're probably thinking that this does not sound much like a religious rite at all. I mean, there's no way in hell that anyone today would stand up to give their wedding vows and start talking about their partner's honeypot lids. It just wouldn't happen. But when we look at the Mesopotamian customs when it came to marriages, royal marriages in particular, we see how sex was not a taboo at all, and certainly not something to be embarrassed over. In fact, it was quite the contrary. The poem was believed to have been a part of what was known as a sacred marriage, in which the king would symbolically marry the goddess Inanna before sleeping with her. Inanna was the goddess of love and war, but she also functioned as a fertility goddess. By symbolically sleeping with this goddess, the king could ensure that he and his wife were fertile, as well as ensuring prosperity, fortune and favour with the gods. According to Sumerian belief, this was a procession that took place annually, and it was the duty of the king to marry a priestess of Inanna in order to ensure fertility of both the womb of his wife and the soil of his people. It is therefore most likely that the poem we have here was actually penned by one of these priestesses of Inanna in the moments before she was paired with Shu Sin. The precise details of this sacred marriage ritual are still unknown to us, but it is believed that such ceremonies were met with the excitement that any one of us would have on Christmas Eve. Parties were held in several buildings, feasts were made in honour of the king, the streets were alive with music and dancing. All the while the king was taking another wife, and for all we know, may not have even remembered her poem once she finished reading it. In some traditions of this sacred marriage, the king would become the deity Dumazid, who was the celestial lover of Inanna, and so once more, the union between king and priestess was symbolic of the union between Dumazid and Inanna. However, there may be yet another symbolic notion as to why the king took on the role of Dumazid in these sacred marriages. Dumazid was believed to be an agricultural deity, much like Enlil or Ninhursag, for he was said to be occupied with the growing and maintaining of crops and plants. With this idea, Dumazid was considered to be a friend of humanity, blessing them with trees, flowers, plants and crops, as well as being seen as their maintainer, protecting them from the supernatural evils and guarding them from ruin. Whilst he was never specifically prayed to, those who did were likely to request more resources such as grain and cattle, given his dominion over them, or perhaps for an extended period or earlier emergence of springtime. It was during springtime that Dumazid would undertake his duties, for it is during springtime that the land was abundant and most fertile. Now, the Mesopotamians weren't necessarily as well versed in the science of botany as we are today, and in a time when man was at the mercy of nature and her harsh elements, they found comfort in embracing fantasy and myth, in order to explain why their crops prospered and why they failed. So by this logic, if springtime proved to be the most fertile time for crops and plants, then Dumazid was believed to have been amongst them, and his careful hand ensured successful production. But alternatively, if summer brought dry and barren land, then Dumazid was believed to have been absent, and had not only deserted humanity, but also forsaken his crops and plants. 
Rather than believe that Dumuzid could be as fickle as the seasons, it was far more noble for the Mesopotamians to view Dumuzid as having died. So every summer, the people across Sumer would mourn his death with great expression. In fact, this appears to have been one of the more notable ways in which he was worshipped, perhaps one of the more unique methods of paying tribute to one's deity. In some regions of Sumer, the period of mourning would last an entire month, where residents would openly weep for the death of their god, and perhaps on a more crucial level, weep for the lack of fertile ground for which to work with. But for the weeping locals, their grief would be only temporary, for in the autumn seasons, when the devastating dry season was over, the land became fertile again, and with this, Dumazid had returned from the dead. For the people of Sumer, this became the status quo, the cycle of life, if you will, with Dumazid paying the ultimate price every year, but always returning to bring plants and crops. With this, Dumazid was a welcome deity, and his continuous return was a cause for celebration and joy. It's possible, therefore, that by adopting the guise of Dumazid during the sacred marriage, the king was not only ensuring his own prosperity by getting it on with one of Inanna's priestesses, but that he was ensuring the prosperity of all of his people, as a divine conduit of a god who brought springtime. But there may have been yet another omen as to why the king chose to adopt the guise of Dumazid, and his wife adopted the guise of Inanna. In the tale of Inanna's descent into the underworld, Inanna, after having been exiled, is able to escape the clutches of the underworld. However, a horde of demons are sent after her, and they follow her up out of the dark depths and onto the surface. The demons, under the command of Inanna's sister, Ereshkigal, who was the governess of the underworld, decree that if Inanna won't return to the underworld, then someone else will have to take her place. The demons take their pick from various characters that are loyal to Inanna, but because of their devotion and their heartfelt mourning of her absence, Inanna vouches for them and stops the demons from taking them. But when the demons come upon Dumazid, they find him seated in Inanna's throne, having the time of his life no less. He is described as being entertained by several slave girls, roaring with laughter and drinking to his heart's content, evidently unfazed and unbothered that his wife has been exiled at all. Now, you might argue that this was Dumazid's way of processing his loss, and that his debaucherous antics were a unique way of dealing with the grief of having lost his wife. But Inanna doesn't give him a chance to explain, and instead nominates him as the person who should take her place. The demons were all but happy to oblige, and without any hesitation, they pluck Dumazid from his wife's throne and carry him off to the underworld, effectively marking his death. But in the Sumerian poem The Return of Dumazid, where Dumazid's sister Geshtinana laments over his death, she is joined by Inanna, who appears to also mourn for her husband, and arguably has either forgiven him or dearly misses him. Together, they journey to find Dumazid in the underworld, and decide that their ill-fated relative is to be offered some peace. It is then decreed that Dumazid will spend half of the year with his sister Geshtinana in the underworld, and the other half of the year in heaven, with Inanna. With this narrative, it can be argued that Dumazid died every year when spring came to an end, where he was returned to the underworld to be with his sister. But come autumn, he was risen again to be with his wife, and brought with him the blessings that were expected of an agricultural god. With this concept, the king, or Dumazid, uniting with the priestess, or Inanna, was something of a visual representation for the Mesopotamians that their cherished god and goddess had reconciled, and that the blessings of spring were soon to be on their way. It may have also provided hope in an otherwise turbulent society, where love and monogamy were evidently strained concepts that were probably difficult to maintain. It showed the people that even the gods had disputes with their spouses, but that regardless of what transgressions either partner had committed, in Dumazid's case, not mourning his wife's death, anything could be overcome. Going by that last example, not even death could stop the love between Inanna and Dumazid, and even though he had been condemned to hell by her, they still found a way to make their relationship work. With the concept of sacred marriage being so visceral, it does lead me to consider the idea 
that it's possible the kings just wanted to fulfill a fantasy of spending a night with the goddess Inanna. In this instance, it would have nothing to do with the aforementioned wholesomeness of the two stories, but instead about one man's efforts to know a goddess intimately, and thus connect himself to divinity. Like many kings, it was believed that they were not only blessed by the gods, but even descended from them. And so, what better way to prove your affiliation by mounting arguably the most revered goddess in all of Mesopotamia? Interestingly, it should also be noted that in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, the king who several kings aspire to be like, actually spurned Inanna when she made advances on him. In fact, a spurn may be too lenient of a word, for when she comes to his bedchambers to seduce him, he insults her, brings up her exes, calls her a cow, and pretty much holds the door open for her to leave. If you ask me, the poem doesn't necessarily convey much that would be applicable in today's day and age. After all, as a society, we are far more promiscuous and forthcoming with our sexuality. Yet saying that, there are elements of the poem and the culture of Mesopotamia that are quite shocking. Elements that even we would think twice about voicing, let alone practicing. These grand parties to celebrate the sexual union between man and wife would certainly be viewed as barbaric, and inappropriate at the very least. And I suppose in that sense, the Mesopotamians were a more liberal and freer type of people. But furthermore, the idea of a man or woman fantasizing over a goddess during the act is definitely not something that is often celebrated, let alone tolerated. But if we look at the poem as an isolated piece of literature, and strip it of its societal influence and ceremonial function, can it tell us anything at all? Bridegroom, dear to my heart, goodly is your beauty, honey sweet. Lion, dear to my heart, goodly is your beauty, honey sweet. The first lines of the poem give us the idea that the Mesopotamians valued beauty in the same way that we do today. But whether they speak of one's inner beauty or their physical beauty is not determined here. Addressing her mate as a lion, the poet shows us that nicknames or pet names may very well have been a thing back then too, which in my humble opinion, definitely trumps today's tiger, sugar, and the dreaded bay. The use of lion, however, may also have been a throwback to Inanna, who was believed to also pursue relationships with animals. Comparing someone to a lion would also come with the obvious connotations, the king of the jungle, an elegant beast, and an indomitable predator. You have captivated me, let me stand tremblingly before you. Bridegroom, I would be taken by you to the bedchamber. You have captivated me, let me stand tremblingly before you. I would be taken by you to the bedchamber. Evidently, the poet certainly wasn't shy by her unmistakable requests. Women in this sense were given the opportunity to be pursuers. They were the ones in some semblance who were required to do the wooing in this example. In a society where one of the most significant deities was a woman, it could be understood that women of Mesopotamia enjoyed a social position that empowered them, at least when compared to other ancient communities, where women were viewed as lesser. Bridegroom, let me caress you. My precious caress is more savoury than honey. In the bedchamber, honey filled. Let me enjoy your goodly beauty. Lion, let me caress you. My precious caress is more savoury than honey. I don't suppose I really need to explain this verse. The poet makes it clear what she wants, and seeks to entice Sinshu to oblige. This may be one interesting aspect that we don't really do anymore, and that's make vivid efforts to declare our feelings. With the fast-paced nature of social media and the increasing expectation of almost instant gratification, perhaps the poem can teach us to be more expressive, to take the time to appreciate the good in our partners and to tell them exactly what it is that we find so alluring about them. Now don't get me wrong, this doesn't have to be sexual. It can be a simple expression of gratitude for something you value in a person. The poet in this example holds nothing back, and while she is focused on the more physical side of things, she does paint quite the picture. Her desire and yearning is unmistakable, and though this is her wedding night, she makes the effort to woo her husband, whilst also declaring her feelings. Reciting poetry these days is not the norm, 
and to be honest, it doesn't need to be. But if two people are able to communicate intimate feelings, as the poet does here, perhaps there is a deeper level of love that many of us have been missing. Bridegroom, you have taken pleasure of me. Tell my mother, she will give you delicacies. My father, he will give you gifts. Now, remember when I said the Mesopotamians were pretty liberal when it came to talking about sex? Well, this is pretty much as liberal as it gets. The poet encourages Sin Shu that after he's had his way with her, he should go and tell her mother and father, for both will be pleased to hear about it. Now, I don't know many people out there this ballsy, but I couldn't imagine going up to anyone's parents and bragging about anything remotely scandalous. As we know in Mesopotamia, this ceremony was celebrated by everyone, and so whether or not the parents enjoyed hearing about how the king had conquered their daughter, or whether they secretly loathed it, it really isn't known to us. They sure couldn't stop it either way. As far as the oldest love poem in the world teaching us anything, I'd say this is probably one of the worst things you could do. Your spirit, I know where to cheer your spirit. Bridegroom, sleep in our house until dawn. Your heart, I know where to gladden your heart. Lion, sleep in our house until dawn. Here the poet is telling Su Sin to stay the night with her. Despite this being her wedding night, in today's standards, you could probably view this as an elaborate, glorified one night stand. Remember, the king got to do this every year with a different priestess. He didn't know who they were, what they were like, and probably didn't even know their names, given the fact that this was meant to be Inanna. He had no emotional obligation to her, and so, after having slept with her, there may not have been a tremendous amount of intention to stay. This may not have been true for the poet in question, who would have been raised to love the king as if he was a god, a person she had seen every day paraded through the streets. She claims that she knows his heart, and that she knows how to gladden him, and be that as it may, it's hard to believe that the feeling would have been mutual. The adoration in her words may very well have been authentic, but for Su Sin, he was probably much less attached. What wisdom do these lines have for us today? Well, it'd probably be a good idea, depending on how emotionally invested you are in a person, to be certain that they feel the same way, so as to avoid the uncertainty that one might subsequently feel. The poet demonstrates this uncertainty in her efforts to get Xu Xin to stay with her, for surely if she was certain, she wouldn't have asked him at all. This isn't to say that spontaneous encounters are wrong, or that the customs of Mesopotamia were not practical but merely that it is good practice to be cautious of who we give ourselves to, both in the physical and in the emotional. You, because you love me, give me prey of your caresses, my Lord God, my Lord Protector, my Shu Sin, who gladdens Enlil's heart. The poet here literally compares Shu Sin to a god, determining him to be her Lord and Protector. She also decrees that Shu Sin finds favour with Enlil, the principal deity of the Pantheon, and so by association, it's reasonable to believe that the poet did so too. There's almost an implication here, given that the poet decrees Shu Sin as her god and not Enlil, and that is that she values her king more than the actual deity. So fervent is her passion for Shu Sin, that she would turn to him as lord and protector before consulting the almighty Enlil, he who had the power to flood the lands and destroy humanity. She has absolute faith in Shu Sin, to the point that not even the gods can come before him. She trusts him completely with both her body and her well-being, whilst also risking the smiting from Enlil, who we know was hot-tempered. Perhaps the poem seeks to show us here the level of love that we should aspire to have. We should fully trust our partners, and we should think the world of them. And indeed, whilst they may have flaws, as we all do, they should be regarded higher than most other things in our lives. The poet, for example, places Shu Sin above a god, but I know several couples who wouldn't place their partner above a cheeseburger. Literally a true story, by the way. In any case, perhaps the poet aims to show us that if we truly love someone, we will prioritize them, and nothing, not even a god, would be able to say otherwise. Give me prey of your caresses, your place goodly as honey. Pray lay your hand on it. Bring your hand over like a honeypot lid. 
cup your hand over it like a honeypot lid. The end section appears to be the final invitation to sex, but the meaning is lost on my totally innocent brain. It appears to be a euphemism, honeypot lid being a euphemism for, well, I'll, I'll let you fill in the holes, uh, fill in the blanks even. I've also seen various translations of the text replace honeypot with a gishban garment, but I wasn't able to find an adequate explanation for that example either. If you came to this video hoping to find some love advice, you're probably feeling like you've got more questions than you did before. Heck, you're probably thinking that the Mesopotamians don't really give us much in the way of practical advice at all. The poem, amazing as it is, may not have any direct answers that are applicable to us. But what about another ancient poem? A poem that also features the passionate declarations between two lovers. It was once believed that the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, was the oldest love poem ever. Indeed, until it was knocked off by the Song for Su Xin. Its title, The Song of Songs, indicates that this was the greatest song of all time. Now the author of the poem was A, aware of the impact that the narrative would have, and B, pretty proud of themselves. Debate has been made as to whether the song was actually composed by Solomon himself, but it's probable that the song existed independently from the king, and was only later associated with him because of his name being dropped later on in the poem. With Solomon's name included in the passages, it would find its way into a relatively unknown or frequently overlooked section of the Bible. The Song of Songs features quite a lengthy dialogue that details the love between a woman and a man. Throughout the interaction, a third party, usually a group of people often labelled as others, join in with the conversation, in an effort to show support and solidarity of their union. Whilst it was once considered to be an allegory of God's love for mankind, it has since come to be viewed for what it is, the love between a man and a woman. But surely, given that this poem made its way into the Bible, it couldn't possibly be as unapologetically erotic as the love song for Shu Sin, could it? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth is the first line of the poem, and already you can tell that we're in for a good show. The poem begins with the voice of a young woman yearning for her lover, one who she is keen to tell us is a pretty good kisser. She declares that his love is better than wine, showing us how deeply infatuated she is with him and how intoxicated she has become by him. She compares his name to a fragrant oil, suggesting that he not only smells nice, but that his very name is enough to draw her towards him. She wishes to run away with this man, to abandon her life as she knows it, and trade up for a life with her lover, even if it is the unknown. Furthermore, she also declares that the king has brought her into his bedchambers, presumably her lover being the king. This gives rise to the idea that the man she lusts after is King Solomon, and that though they are not married, she is prepared to risk transgressing against the Lord's rules so that she may know him intimately. Another possible idea is that the woman thinks so highly of her lover that she sees him as a king more specifically, as King Solomon, even though to everyone else, he is indeed just a regular man. This may very well be symbolic of the old rose-tinted glasses, and how when we are in love, we may view someone as flawless, beautiful, and perfect, but to our friends, they're pretty mediocre. The second party of this poem then joins in, a spectatory group known as the Others and these were believed to be the citizens of Jerusalem, who had witnessed the woman's love and were in support of it. Throughout the poem, they offer words of encouragement, and though many of the woman's desires are not congruent with the customs of ancient Israel, they concur with her sentiments. The woman acknowledges the words of her neighbours, and while she is grateful, she begins to harbour doubt. She expresses that because she tends to the vineyards in the blazing sun, her skin is dark, and in her eyes, this makes her less attractive and less worthy of love. She also declares that her brothers are angry with her, for they have made her tend to the vineyards and work in the blistering heat. With this, she adopts a kind of Cinderella-esque character, forced to do the chores and labours of her evil siblings. She states that while she has tended to the vineyards, she has neglected her own vineyard, 
or that she has neglected her own appearance in service to her family. The poem seeks to show the woman's declining self-esteem and the tragedy that she thinks she's unattractive because of the color of her skin. She begins to daydream of her beloved, imagining him as a shepherd, which gives rise to the idea that this isn't Solomon, and instead a modest shepherd more befitting of her social station. Yet one might say that Solomon was a shepherd to his people, and so this shepherd analogy may simply be symbolic. She cries out to her lover to know where he is, and ponders over whether she ought to be less modest in her dress, in an effort to entice him. The man in question then emerges in the poem, and obtains his own voice, where he tells her that if she wants to find him, then all she has to do is follow the flock, implying that he isn't doing anything immoral behind her back, and isn't away from her for any reason other than to fulfill his duties. He also suggests that he is easy to find, and that she will always be able to find him, before declaring to her that she is lovely the way she is, and that her skin colour, dress sense, and physical appearance is perfect. With this, the people of Jerusalem join in again, and furthermore show support for their love by promising to make gold and silver jewellery for the woman. The poem continues with this format for the next few pages, with the woman continuing to express her love as she states, While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. It's arguable here that after having her love reciprocated, the woman's self-esteem is restored, because all of a sudden, she is confident that her attractiveness is enough to keep her suitor interested and draw him to her couch. She compares him to a scent that stays with her, and even when he is absent, his fragrance sustains her. Behold, you are beautiful, my love, he tells her in response. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. And this is pretty much how a huge chunk of this poem goes, with the woman complimenting the man, and the man complimenting her right back. It's also interesting to see that the woman's confidence is suddenly boosted to heights that she probably had not thought possible, where she goes on to declare, I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. In comparing herself to flowers, she expresses recognition of her own beauty, which is a stark comparison to her reservations about herself in the beginning. It might be said that this is what love has the power to do for us in reality, to make us feel bolder and more beautiful than we had previously thought. For surely, if we were able to capture a person who we deemed attractive, then surely that would mean that we possess some attractive virtues too. This is perhaps why breakups are so difficult, for it isn't necessarily always the loss of a person that makes us depressed, but more so the loss of how we feel about ourselves. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young woman. The man responds to her, confirming that she is beautiful, and that she is more beautiful than the people around her, likely those of her own family, who put her to work in the first place. He compares those around her to brambles, making it clear that she stands out amongst them, and thus it is no wonder why he has chosen her over everyone else, likely everyone else in Jerusalem. In the next section, the woman appears to begin daydreaming about the man, and how he has taken her on a date to a wine house. There he publicly declares his love for her, before they chow down and start eating lots of delicious foods together. She implies that food is a necessity in order to retain her strength, for she is lovesick, and that because of the intensity of the feelings she has received from her lover, it has left her weak. With this, she segues into another daydream that's more intimate in nature, whereby the two of them are lying on a couch, embracing. In some interpretations, this is much less a daydream and more of an actual happening, where the two lovers not only lie down together, but actually have sex. So unable to resist each other, they throw their traditions to the wind and give in to their desires for one another. This sees the woman give a subsequent warning to her neighbors, saying, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love 
until it pleases. In one sense, it may be cautionary to the women of Jerusalem that they should not give themselves up physically to a man until they are sure about him. This signposts back to my earlier point that one should be cautious when engaging in any sort of romantic endeavour, but it might also be said that this was the woman venting frustration at her fellow women for having interrupted what might have been a pretty vivid daydream. Later in bed by herself, the maiden dreams that she is searching for her lover in the streets of the city. After inquiring with the city watchman, she ends up locating her lover and doesn't let go of him until she has brought him back to her mother's house. Once more she repeats the line, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. This suggests that this is indeed more of a plea or request to her fellow women not to wake her from her dream because such a sequence is far sweeter than the reality she knows. She continues to envision a lavish wedding in which the groom is either King Solomon or takes the form of King Solomon, a physical representation of how great the woman believed her lover to be. When she spots her husband approaching, again in the form of Solomon, she is starstruck, telling us, what is that coming up from the wilderness, like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are sixty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords, an expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh, against terror by night. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seats of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love. By the daughters of Jerusalem, go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him, on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. The man speaks to her and proceeds to lavish her with compliments and pretty on-the-nose statements as he compares her body parts to either something pleasant or sometimes something utterly random. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins and not one among them has lost its young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. The next time you're talking to someone you fancy on either a dating app or in person, I implore you to drop the line, your neck is like the Tower of David. Forget everything you've heard from dating coaches on YouTube, use this one line and I promise you it will work. Promise. After this, the man calls for the woman to leave her home and to return with him to his garden, where they can eat and drink together for eternity. This notion is seconded by the third party, who call for the couple to be drunk in love. In yet another dream by the woman, she hears her lover knocking on her door during the night, but when she goes to answer, he disappears. My beloved put his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh, on the handles of the bolts. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. She goes out to look for her lover, but when the city guard finds her instead, they begin to beat her and rob her of her clothes. With this, she turns to her neighbours for assistance, who ask her what her lover looks like, which in turn gives birth to another long section of praise and compliments as the maiden attempts to describe him. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, she starts off. Distinguished among 10,000, 
His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves, beside streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are like lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold, set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns, set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Despite having been beaten and arguably taken advantage of by the city guard, the woman is not lost for words when it comes to her lover. So desperate she is to be with him again that she puts aside her ordeal, not even deeming it worth mentioning, and expresses only her love for the man she sought after. Instead of nursing her own wounds or concerning herself over her own misfortune, she is vivid and passionate in her efforts to illustrate what her lover looked like. In fact, it's such a colourful description that it seems she's enjoying listing his every attribute, and that with just the mere thought of him, she is safe and content, despite her recent encounter with the gods. Once more, this might be a metaphor for how blindsided we can be when we're in love, and that things that ought to be able to tear us down can sometimes feel irrelevant, especially if the one we love has disappeared. Suddenly, nothing else matters, and like the woman in the poem, she cares not for her own being, and only for her missing lover. Luckily, the two end up finding each other in the garden, and the man is back at it again, with his efforts to be a smooth operator. He tells the woman, You are beautiful as Terza, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn away your eyes from me, for they overwhelm me, so it's possible here that he hasn't even noticed that his woman has been roughed up by the city guard, as all he can see is her beauty. The woman doesn't appear to submit this information to him either, and it would seem that both are relieved to be reunited more than anything else. He compares her to Terza, an ancient Canaanite city west of the Jordan River, as well as once a capital of the Northern Kingdom. He describes her beauty as being awesome, or perhaps so overwhelming that it has the same strength as an army. In fact, her beauty becomes so overwhelming for him that he asks her to turn away from him. But he's not done there. He states, How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter! Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Heshbon. By the gate of Bath Rabim, your nose is like a tower of Lebanon, which looks towards Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses. If anyone can successfully work your nose is like a tower of Lebanon into a pickup line, I will offer you a free digital cookie. Indeed, whilst it probably wouldn't work well for us today, it probably would have worked well for this guy, whose girlfriend was so in love with him, he probably could have insulted her and she still wouldn't have minded. In this instance, it probably was a compliment to suggest that she had a strong nose or strong features. You can see he also refers to her navel as being bowl-shaped and her belly as a heap of wheat. Things that might sound offensive to us, but had a more wholesome intention back then. He also refers to her hair being purple. Purple being considered a rare colour and something worn only by royalty in ancient times. The woman is swooned by the man's words and invites him to join her in her fields and villages, promising to give him her love amongst the vineyards. Come, my beloved, she tells him. Let us go into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. At last, she succumbs to physical desire 
and orchestrates exactly where they will be able to make love. A place that's seemingly private enough in fields. Again, a place that perhaps only she would tread, given that she was made to tend to the vineyards by her brothers. However, the subsequent lines imply that their lovemaking in the fields is not ideal, for though they may be private, this isn't necessarily how she wants their relationship to continue. She states, Oh, that you were like a brother to me, who nursed at my mother's breasts. If I found you outside, I would kiss you, and none would despise me. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Wishing that her lover was like her brother isn't as incestuous as it might sound on first glance. Instead, she merely ponders on how easy it would be to be seen with him if he were her brother, and that if that were the case, no one would really bat an eyelid as to what they were up to. However, because he is obviously a suitor, his presence around her is bound to drum up interest, and perhaps even resistance from her family, given that the two are not married. She begins to speak of all the things she would like to do for him, if they were accepted as they were, that she would kiss him openly, bring him home to her mother, feed him, and guiltlessly enjoy his embrace. With this testament, she also pleads again to her neighbours and her family not to wake her from her dream, for even in this more melancholic phase of her dream, she wishes to experience love in its fullest. After this, she urges him to choose her and only her, by sealing her upon his heart and body. She states, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave, its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. By being set up as a seal upon his heart and arm, the woman seems to be asking the man to be faithful, to dedicate himself to her, and to demonstrate his commitment to her by use of a seal. As a more modern comparison, this might be like asking your significant other to tattoo your name on them as evidence of their dedication to you. In the woman's terms here, it's obviously a bit more metaphoric. So to be clear, don't actually ask your significant other to tattoo your name on them. It's never ever ever been a good idea, and I'm willing to bet it never will be. She adds that love is as strong as death. And if we use the seal analogy here, we can see that she meant that love, like death, is meant to be permanent. It's meant to last forever. In this, the woman seeks to show us that love should not be taken so lightly, and where we might regard death with the utmost reverence, we ought to do the same with love. Love is also associated with the flames of fire here, a flame that cannot be quenched by water, which further reinforces the idea that love cannot be stifled or defeated. It might also be said that love is like fire. It has many uses, like bringing warmth and cooking food. Yet fire, like love, can also be used for destruction, by consuming the unfortunate and leaving only ashes in its wake. She ends this section with a rather profound comment, in that if someone offered love at the price of their house, they would be utterly despised. Put simply, if you charge someone for your love, then you would eventually become despised and no one would want to be with you. It's the idea that love can only be brought with love, and that if you truly wish to experience it, it can only be done authentically. The sex can be purchased, but love must be given freely. We can quite clearly see that the Mesopotamian love song of Shu Sin and the biblical Song of Songs are two very different pieces of literature. There have been some efforts to synchronise the meaning of the two pieces, to show that both represent fertility, given that the love song of Shu Sin involves fertility gods and goddesses, whilst the song of songs involves some specific mentions of fields, plants and animals. The man and woman's frequent comparisons of each other's bodies to wildlife and foliage does show some support of this idea, but to me, the poems are not trying to convey the same message, 
Indeed, one was used specifically for a sexual ceremony, and conducted with the intentions of glorifying and enticing the king. The other was used to show us the depth of love, how potent it can be, and how two people can become harmonized by it. So what can it show us today? The opening lines of the poem, as already discussed, are quite telling. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Once more, these are not the typical lines that one would expect to find in the Bible, and I'm willing to bet that if this was a text found years after the Bible's compilation, it wouldn't have ever made it in there. It isn't necessarily the fact that the text is scandalous or raunchy, but more so it does more to challenge the idea of chastity, at least before marriage, that's still practiced in some religious traditions today. It is true that everyone has lustful thoughts, and perhaps this is another thing that the poem seeks to show us, that lustful thoughts are normal, and that anyone can be tempted to act upon their feelings. But because of how explicit it can be in some areas, particularly where the woman agrees to make love with the man in the fields of her home, some might say that the passages do more to tempt fate than offer solace. With this, I'm more inclined to see the text with a more liberal perspective, in that it shows us that love need not be this forbidden, taboo, or restricted element, and that it should be experienced to the fullest, including sex. Throughout the Old Testament, love and sex are strictly monitored, and more often than not, have dire consequences for those who partake in it. Pharaoh is punished for his advances on Sarah, Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed for their sexuality, Abraham is met with controversy as he sleeps with another woman, Jacob is warned not to marry a Canaanite woman. Pretty much anything to do with love in the Bible comes with rules, regulations, and consequences. And this is what the Song of Solomon ultimately ends up telling us, that love cannot be bound, it can know no limits, and like the idea of God, it cannot be silenced. We've already discussed how the woman's self-esteem is boosted after she surrenders to love, and this could be doubly true in today's world. You know how it is when your body receives that shot of oxytocin. You literally do feel as if you're walking on clouds, and so when the woman in the story is suddenly shed of her insecurities in the face of love, it's certainly something we can relate to. Admittedly, the story might be hyperbolizing how we might feel today when we're in love, but it's true we can become comfortable with our imperfections if someone else makes us feel good about them. Much more, if someone else genuinely loves us for them. The woman in the story is concerned about the colour of her skin, but after being told by her lover that she is beautiful, it is not something that she ever brings up again. In fact, she is empowered, going on to refer to herself as the Lily of the Valley and the Rose of Sharon, flowers that whilst may not be the most prettiest, showing us the woman's modesty, are still a grand step up from her earlier impressions of herself. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me, she says in the beginning of the poem, which is ironic because by the end of the poem, the man tells her not to look at him, for he cannot handle how beautiful she is. Love by this example shows us that it can make us view ourselves differently. It can make us feel worthy of so much more, and ultimately, it can make us happy in our own skin. Of course, in the modern world, there is also a pitfall to this, in that if one becomes too reliant on the love that is received, then we ultimately become dependent on that person for our happiness. This is all well and good when things are going alright, but should there be a reckoning in the relationship, a person's accumulated self-worth could be dashed if their partner's attitude towards them changes. The Song of Songs does very little to prepare the reader for such an outcome, given that the man and woman seemingly get together and live happily ever after. But in the real world, things are seldom that simple. The Song of Songs portrays the woman as constantly seeking out the man, to the point that she has no regard for herself. She is beaten and stripped in the streets by the gods, yet the poem seeks to show us that this is a result of her intense love, and doesn't address the danger in maintaining such a perspective. Today, we might consider that the poet here is obsessed, given that she is so consumed by her love as she puts him first every time. Indeed, there's usually nothing wrong with putting your partner first, 
but to do so over your own detrimental needs is certainly a recipe for disaster. Put simply, the Song of Songs is realistically a portrayal of puppy love, or the fiery explosive love we experience when we first start dating someone. It can be exhilarating and breathtaking, but by those virtues, it can also be dangerous and consuming. The poem does a good job of portraying this former version of love, with its exciting twists and tingling turns, but it doesn't portray the grim descents and pitfalls that naturally come with such highs. Ultimately, the poem does more to show us an idealistic example of love, perhaps the early stages of love, where everything is electric and everything is pure. In essence, your partner can do no wrong during this honeymoon period, and though you may recognise behaviours that would otherwise turn you off, you become content to ignore it, at least for now. The poem does little to portray this aspect, and both man and woman are so blinded by each other's physical beauty that they don't really begin to get to know each other. They don't argue, they don't disagree, and they don't appear to have any real interest in growing beyond what they are, because to each other, they are perfect. Now yes, this is a form of love, being harmonious, being in agreement, and being content with who the other person is. But I would argue that this is only one type of love, perhaps the love we all experience in the beginning. And if I'm going to be honest, I think it's a more superficial and weaker kind of love. The poem fails to convey the real essences of a relationship, in that they aren't always sunshines and rainbows. In fact, they often take hard work, discipline, compromise, and hard truths. Albeit, in the beginning of a relationship, as the Song of Songs clearly shows us, things are sunshines and rainbows. But contrary to the woman's statement that love is eternal fire, it is not. At least, not this type of love. Another element which I believe keeps relationships going is our ability to grow and grow the other person. The man and woman in the poem accept each other wholeheartedly, and are deemed perfect in each other's eyes. But I would argue that this is not a sentiment that should be strived for when seeking a potential mate. We should always strive to be better, not just for our partner, but for ourselves too, in an effort to cultivate a union that A, neither partner will get bored of, and B, equips each partner to stand on their own if need be. In this aspect, I do feel as if the poem conveys an unrealistic image of what love is, one that certainly is poetic and sought after, but not one that is permanently obtainable. Another aspect of the poem that conveys a lesson we might not want to adopt is that everything that is praised and glorified between the two lovers is physical. Let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Our face and our voice are two of the many things that we have no control over when it comes to our bodies. We are how we look and we are how we sound, and going by society's definition, sometimes this can be advantageous and sometimes it can be downright rotten. So it's interesting that in the poem, the woman holds the man's face and voice in such high regard and seeks to praise him for it. Now it's true that we all find different things attractive, and that when we're in a relationship, we find certain physical features about our partner attractive, but we wouldn't necessarily define our partner by their lovely faces, their sweet voices, or their Tower of David-like necks. This is what the Song of Songs does, for both partners are characterised and defined by how they look, not for their individual characteristics. Your hair is like a flock of goats, leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes, that have come up from the washing, all of them bear twins, not one among them has lost its young. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranate behind your veil. Never do they stop to talk about their personal traits, their strengths, their intelligence, their humour, nothing. Pretty much most of the poem is long-winded compliments that aim to honour the superficial. It's true again that this may be the case of an early relationship, for it is usually the physical things about a person that draw us in in the first place. But I would argue that it is not the physical aspects of a person that keep us in their company, but more so what they have to say, how funny they are, how deep they are, how kind they are, and whether they are aligned with our values. The couple in Song of Songs barely even talk to each other outside of their own rituals of praise, 
and so it is quite hard to derive a lesson from this ancient text that would be really applicable to a real life relationship. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. O may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. Both characters are just as guilty as the other when it comes to idolizing each other's bodies, and whilst there's really nothing wrong with this, the absence of more substantial attraction in terms of personality, morals, intelligence and strength leave the poem feeling vacant and more along the lines of visual fluff than deep-seated wisdom. Of course, you could easily just turn around here and say, bro, chill the f out, it's just a poem. But the purpose of the video is to see what lessons we can take away from the ancient texts. And the Song of Songs, at least for me, doesn't convey a required realism. However, in contradiction to pretty much everything I've just said about this poem, one idea is that the poem is just a daydream of a woman. This then isn't meant to be a profound document of holy knowledge and wisdom, but instead merely the thoughts of an arguably horny woman describing her ideal man, and or vice versa. It would explain why neither character stops to address their partner's non-physical traits, and why everything in the poem is so straightforward and so perfect. As a daydream, it's meant to be unrealistic. It's a fantasy, one that the author knows cannot be achieved, but by some innocent delusion, the character does. Having analyzed two of the most ancient love poems, if we've learned anything from the words of our ancestors, it's that we might very well be better off now. The love song of Shu Sin presents the idea that a priestess was required to write an enticing poem for use in a ritual, where the king would then have sex with her. We know very little about this concept of sacred marriage that occurred, and so it's impossible to really know the feelings that were involved during this ceremony. As a priestess of Inanna, it's arguable that the woman in question saw this act as a great honour, and perhaps her words in the poem were as authentic as they seem. But if we were to re-establish such an act in today's modern world, I'm pretty sure there'd be some rightful outrage. The concept of organised marriage is still practised today in modern society, but an organised public ritual that's celebrated for its promiscuity is perhaps something that's better left in the past. When we look at the organised marriages in Mesopotamia for regular folk, those who were not Dumazid and Inanna reborn, aka the king and the priestess, marriage was much less fun and more of a vital component of society, for it ensured the continuation of one's family and offered a certain stability for all intended parties. It is believed that organised marriages were pretty much how things went back then, with women even being sold at bridal auctions. The love song of Shu Sin leads us to believe that marriage in Mesopotamia was a deeply romantic celebration, and whilst this may have been the case for the king in his annual weddings, it wasn't necessarily the case for ordinary couples. For them, it was more of a business transaction, where women from all over the land would present themselves, or were presented by their families, to the single men of the area and bid it on for their beauty. Indeed, going back to my point about physical beauty being a focal point in the Song of Songs, it may have been the case back then that physical traits were so much more sought after because of the belief that attractive physical traits meant physically attractive babies. It was believed that naturally the richest men would bid on the most beautiful women, and those who couldn't afford such a high price ended up settling for the more homely looking women. Despite enjoying more freedoms than you'd think, Mesopotamian women were believed to have been made to become priestesses of Inanna, and were forced to have sex with whatever stranger had chosen her. Ancient Greek historian Herodotus explained that this was a custom that ensured the continued growth of the community, but such a custom also contradicted the fact that a woman's virginity was her only ticket into marriage. There is much scholarly debate as to whether Herodotus was correct in his assessment of Mesopotamian women, but as of yet, we are no closer to really understanding the role that women had to play at Inanna's temple, nor the necessary prerequisites allowing her to marry. In any case, it seems like women had it pretty rough, and when we consider whether our attitude towards love has changed, I'd say we've come pretty far from the Mesopotamians. 
Indeed, romantic love did play a part in marriages. That emotional component was likely inevitable, but it wasn't the primary reason why people got married. It would seem that marriage was done less so in the name of love and more so in the name of procreation. With procreation being the aim of the game, it should come as no surprise, as we've outlined in the love song of Shu Sin, that sex wasn't the taboo that it's since become, in both religious communities and some secular societies. The Mesopotamians were not embarrassed by sex, they did not exhibit shyness when it came to these matters, and going by French historian Jean Botero, pretty much anything went in the bedroom, or the street for that matter. Homosexuality was also not shunned nor discriminated against, and those partaking could enjoy the act without the fear of modern social stigma. Botero noted that making love was a natural activity, as culturally ennobled as food was elevated by cuisine. Why on earth should one feel demeaned or diminished or guilty in the eyes of the gods, practicing it in whatever way one pleased, always provided that no third party was harmed, or that one was not infringing any of the customary prohibitions which control daily life. If you ask me, this is one of the aspects from the Mesopotamian era that we've probably lost out on, and where our attitude towards love has changed for the worse. But another aspect of love in which we've become more progressive, although I suspect this may be divisive, is divorce. It's true that in love there's also the possibility of falling out of love, and today, divorce, as tricky as it may be, does sever the legal ties between husband and wife. In Mesopotamia, however, divorce had serious social implications. Men were usually the initiators of divorce, which is actually significantly different now, as far as Western statistics go, with women being the ones to make the final call. A man in Mesopotamia was allowed to divorce his wife if she proved to be infertile, which again goes back to procreation being the aim of the game. However, he'd have to return her dowry, and possibly be pressured by the law to adopt a concubine, who could give him children. It may or may not surprise you that men were not typically blamed for not being able to produce a child, and that a childless marriage was usually because the woman was infertile, not the man. Therefore, the state were more likely to side with the man in divorce proceedings, because as far as they were concerned, the wife had not lived up to her side of the marriage deal, and had also therefore denied the community of children and potential expansion. If a woman had an affair meanwhile, a man could not only divorce her, but also drown her and her lover in the river. If a woman initiated divorce however, she could actually be legally thrown out of the house by the husband, without money and sometimes without clothes. Because a man was considered as something like a king in his household, the woman would need irrefutable evidence that he had neglected her, abused her, or treated her improperly. In some rarer cases, women were known to abandon the home entirely, and instead of obtaining a divorce, opted to move to another city or region in an effort to begin a new life. Now I suppose I'll be divisive here and say that divorces today are a lot less brutal. I mean, at least it's not acceptable for someone to be drowned in the river. Divorces in Mesopotamian culture appear to have most certainly benefited men, and I suppose now we're leaning into something that's more mutually beneficial for both parties. But of course this isn't my area of expertise, and I'm sure the divorcees in the comment section are going to tell me why it's either still the same, or just much worse. As far as the Song of Songs influence goes, I've decided to use what little we know of ancient Israel's marriage laws and combine that with the biblical law in order to estimate how much of our attitude towards love has changed. Marriage in ancient Israel was more unlike the marriage we know of today, though there are some similarities to Mesopotamian marriage. Many readers of the Bible will be familiar with the biblical God's instructions to Adam that man should leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, so that the two of them could become one flesh that they would be fruitful and multiply. In such an ancient society, procreation was once again a focal point, and if a couple were to marry, they had better be busy making babies. However, where the Mesopotamian men were encouraged to take additional wives if their first wife could not conceive, the ancient men of Israelites were surely stumped, because their god had decreed that sex outside of marriage was a sin. Or was it? 
Well, in the earliest years of Israel, polygamy was tolerated, and there was something of a double standard when it came to whether or not a man could have two wives. As far as the Old Testament goes, we saw Abraham take an additional wife at his first wife's command, in order for them to have a child. Whilst this is frowned upon by some commentators, and made to seem like Abraham and Sarah were going against God's instructions, their God never really directly punishes them, nor calls them out for adultery. The same can be said when Abraham offers up Sarah to Pharaoh, so that he might be spared of death. Whether or not Sarah actually sleeps with Pharaoh is up for some debate, but considering Pharaoh's outrage when he learns that the two are actually married, some believe that she actually did. Neither Abraham or Sarah appear to be punished by their god, and so it's reasonable to believe that the early Israelites didn't see it as that big of a deal. It's probable that considering the urgency of growing a family and the need to procreate, the laws set down by their god in regards to polygamy were quietly overlooked. By the time of Jesus, polygamy in Israel had become a thing of the past, and the biblical laws decreed in the New Testament state that a man should only love his wife. Speaking of the time of Christ, there were also celibate men and women who believed that averting sex would bring them closer to God, and such peoples were praised by Jesus for their discipline, strength, and sacrifice. A celibate man in Mesopotamia probably wouldn't have fit in well, and though we can't say for sure how such a man would have been regarded, it's probable he would have been met with suspicion, or maybe even seen as a conquest for other men and women. In the Song of Songs, celibacy is not something that is really considered, seeing as both characters are a sentence away from tearing each other's clothes off. Though you might say that in the build-up to their eventual marriage, the lust that seeps through in their words is indicative of the struggle of remaining pure in the eyes of their god. Our attitude in modern society has come leaps and bounds since these ideas, for the concept of pure isn't necessarily tied to one's sexual history. Having multiple relationships before finding the one and getting married is pretty normalized by now, and in my opinion, it's probably the healthier route in understanding what you as a person like and don't like. Women in ancient Israel were not given the same luxury, and like the woman in Song of Songs, the man she picked had to be the man she stayed with, even if she chose him prematurely, and doubly so if he was chosen for her. Women were also subject to marry as soon as they were physically able to reproduce, which made them eligible as early as 13 or 14 years old. Today, of course, we would view such a practice as inhumane and exploitative, and at least from a Western perspective, such arrangements are abhorred. In those days, of course, these sorts of arrangements were decided by parents. I imagine that young people who had no interest in each other were reluctant to obey their parents' wishes. In the ancient world, though, marriage was not about romance, as we've seen with the Mesopotamians, and this is where the Song of Songs paints an unrealistic expectation of marriage, even for its time period. Marriage was instead about survival. It was about establishing families and securing a certain social security within one's own community. Romance there might have been, but this came only secondary to the demands of society. One idea that comes from the Song of Songs, although never specified, is that the woman in question is betrothed to another man, but that she longs for the one that she speaks of in the poem. This forbidden love, if you will, would have naturally been intense, and it makes sense that the wording of the poem reflects such charged feelings of the star-crossed lovers. It also makes sense as to why the woman is daydreaming about this man, for this suddenly becomes less about a fantasy of a young woman envisioning her ideal man, but instead about the young woman's fantasy of a man that she can never be with. Our attitude here has obviously changed, for now we no longer see ourselves bound to the expectations of our family and the expectations of society, at least in more western communities and households. Another idea that paints the Song of Songs in a different light stems from the ancient Israelite custom of the betrothal year. During this period, the future bride has been chosen by her future husband, but they still live apart and cannot be together until negotiations between both families have been agreed in regards to the dowry. It might be said that this is where the Song of Songs came from and that the man and woman are eager to be together, hence their declaration of love but are kept apart due to the obligations and negotiations by their family. On the actual day of the wedding, 
it was believed that both the Song of Songs, amongst other love poems, were sung during the procession. This makes it similar to the love song of Xu Xin, in that both poems had a purpose beyond literary entertainment, and both poems were used to signify the union between man and woman. Much like Mesopotamia, the relationship between husbands and wives were not equal. The term Baal, the Hebrew word for husband, could also mean master or lord, which was also indicative of the ownership that a man had over his wife. The mastery over his wife also extended to her life, for if a woman was caught cheating, he was allowed to kill her. On the other hand, with the rules of polygamy being unclear, men could indulge with other women and were allowed to incorporate concubines into the family, particularly if the husband's first wife could not produce children. Needless to say, our attitude towards love has matured in the modern world, and whilst polygamy is still practiced, it is far more common, and I would say socially expected, that monogamous relationships are the norm. So the million dollar question of today's episode, has our attitude towards love changed? Yeah, it sure has, and it will probably continue to change with the ever-fluctuating monster that is society. Will it change for the better? Well, going by what we've seen from history, it's probable that we'll get better at some things and worse at others. The archaeological work completed in 19th century Mesopotamia completely changed the way we understood the world. So who's to say that in a thousand years from now, assuming we haven't completely obliterated each other, that our way of life today won't contain some hollow wisdom for what would then be the modern man and woman. Although the customs of the ancients seem bizarre or even cruel, the Mesopotamians and ancient Israelites provided the first forms of human literature and the very first expression of human emotion that we have. Through these old poems, we are privileged to experience a piece of romantic love, passion, and desire through the eyes of someone who had lived thousands of years ago. It's therefore even more interesting that despite the time that's passed, though our attitude to love might have changed, the fundamentals behind why we seek it and how we feel when we have it, have not. Let me know what you think about our attitude towards love, and what you thought about today's poems in the comments below. This is the first video that's featured the new look of the channel, as you might have gathered. This is me, and this is my cat Zeus. You can see us on these types of videos every other Sunday, as sort of a Sunday special. These are probably going to be a bit more light-hearted, and a bit more off-script. And as I'm sure you've gathered, they're probably going to be longer than usual too. The regular Wednesday upload will still be going up weekly, so fear not. In any case, if you've made it this far, thank you for watching. I'm going to be uploading random subjects and topics here, so let me know if there's anything particular that you'd like to see on Sundays. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe. Until next time.